run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another My JavaScript Story. This week, we're talking to Nader Dabit. Uh, Nader, do you want to say hi? Hello, everyone. Now, you've been on uh, JavaScript Jabber, what, twice? I believe I've been on I've been on once, actually. Uh, we were talking about React Native uh, just in general. We were, I think we were kind of just going over, uh, maybe it was like the second episode or, or third you done on React Native, and we were just kind of, um, it was me and my partner, Mike Grabowski, and we yep. were kind of just talking about the current state of React Native, whereas uh, before you kind of talked about it, but it had been a while, so we were just kind of going over like you know where currently the ecosystem was and things were happening at the time. Yeah, we uh, yeah we we talked on episode two twenty eight, and yeah we had we've we've had like Chris Shido and uh, Jordan Walk, and I could name a handful of other names, you know, that people that have contributed to the React community. But yeah, I don't think we, I don't think we really dug into React Native until we had you guys on the show, and um, yeah, you know, the, things are still, you know, moving in, you know, in that world, and it's really interesting to see where things are going. And then you're also the host of React Native Radio, which is also on DevChat.tv. Right, right, yeah, we've done about eighty-two episodes so far, so we've been going for about two years. Awesome. And it's funny because I, I've heard a few people say, well, is there that much to talk about with React Native? You know, because it's just React with a native renderer. So, you know. Right, right. Well, you know, a lot of the topics that you might cover on a React podcast, we kind of cover some of those. But in reality, just the mobile world in general is so, you know, complex and there's so many different things to take into consideration. So we only we not only cover React and React Native specific things, but we also a lot of times just go into things that um, mobile developers in general might run into, and, and maybe a React Native developer that is new to the mobile world not might not really know about. So they're kind of coming into it from a web background, where, so we can kind of cover things that kind of uh, aren't really specific to React Native, but kind of are helpful to mobile developers. Right, that makes sense. And then um, we'll probably ask about a lot of this stuff, too, at the end of the show when we ask what you're working on now. But, you know, those are some of the things that you've got going on. And then I know you also do training for React Native. And I just kind of want to call these things out so people can, oh, okay, so maybe I should go check these things out. And we talk a little bit more in depth about them later. But um, what's kind of the structure of your React Native training? Do you just go to different cities and do workshops? Or do you wait for companies to call you and say, hey, come train our folks? Well, we do we do a little bit of both. Um, I'm kind of you know copying in, in reality what the success of React training was, and that's like Michael Jackson and Ron Florence. They've been doing you know React web training for quite a bit, and um, uh -huh. you know I started specializing in React Native, and I just just organically started getting companies reaching out for training. So um, I decided to start a company with Mike Grabowski of Callstack. Um, they do React Native consulting, and we just right. kind of threw up a website. Um, we already had a couple of clients going at the time. Um, we just kind of, you know, threw up uh, a contact form and um, we just started getting a lot of leads in. So we kind of have a mix of uh, workshops that we kind of are putting on in different cities. Like we have a couple coming up in 2018 in New York, Seattle, uh, San Francisco and, uh, and Denver. Um, but really the main chunk of our work is actually getting contacted by companies and going in and, and kind of doing like anywhere between two to five days of workshops. We normally spend um, a, a week or two 
um, just discussing the company's needs and what kind of applications they're going to be building, kind of like a discovery process. And then we put together like a, um, a tailored agenda. And then we show up and we, you know, we just work with their, their developers. And a lot of times it's a mix between training, but also kind of helping build maybe the beginning of an application or, or kind of looking at their existing application if they're already working with React Native and giving pointers. So it's not just training. It's kind of a mix between training and consulting. Um, and then we recently just started doing those pop-up workshops, like I mentioned, where um, you can kind of just uh, show up. And uh, if you're not part of a big company that has us coming there, you can kind of still get the same experience um, just by showing up in one of these cities. Gotcha. Well, that sounds awesome. Now, this show is focused more on just telling your story. And so I'm going to change the pace a little bit, and we'll probably come back around to a lot of this stuff toward the end of the show. But uh, to kind of start the interview, you, what I usually ask is, how did you get into programming? So when I was like 17 or 18, <laughs> it was really the first look I got into programming. And it wasn't even really like at the time I would consider programming. It was more like an HTML class. I actually uh -huh. took it at the community college that I was attending at the time. Um, and it was like just a quick, you know, it's one of those things that just opens your eyes to like, you know, what's what's going on if you want to just build a basic web page. And um, after that, I kind of um, spent about 10 or 11 years um, not doing anything related to that. But just having that glimpse into, you know, what web development was, I kind of did play around just building little websites here and there. Kind of um, if a friend or a family member wanted a website, like they knew that they could come to me and I could build just like a landing page, basically what it was. And um, and then um, in my late 20s, um, I was working in retail with my family business, um, was which was basically a clothing store. Uh -huh. And we wanted to kind of get into the e-commerce business. So um, we ended up hiring a couple of different teams of developers and kind of trying to kick that off. But we just had uh, not very good experience because we didn't have any experience <laughs> in tech in general, right? And we didn't know what we were looking for. So every time we tried to do that, it ended up you know, basically being you know, a failure. Um, and... You know, I kind of just was kind of to the point where we were fed up with spending all this money, you know, working with teens and we didn't know right. what we were doing anyway. So it was kind of not just their fault. It was probably our fault, too. Um, and I decided I was going to try to build this out myself. So I, I learned WordPress. I kind of learned an, enough PHP to be able to to uh, change a few things here and there. And um, we launched um, a company. It was called EasySuits.com at the time. And it did really well. And I think after about... It was around maybe nine months or ten months of being in business. Um, we we were doing just a lot of a lot of sales, and I had an opportunity to kind of exit the company and have some money, you know, left over. So um, at that time, I was working like eighty or ninety hours a week on the website, and I was getting burnt out anyway. So I was like, okay, this is a good opportunity to kind of step back, take whatever money we had made uh, from the company, and I decided then I wanted to kind of do this for a living programming, but I didn't have any formal experience. In fact, I never really even worked on a team of developers, uh, you know, at all. So what I had done at that point, um, I started looking for job opportunities out in California at the time I was living in Mississippi. So, um, I pretty much sent, you know, my resume, which was just not really a whole lot on there, um, to just dozens and dozens of companies. And I kind of, uh, just got lucky and found uh, a job oppor uh, opportunity in Los Angeles. So basically, me and my family pretty much just packed up everything, and uh, we had a little bit of money saved. So we moved to LA, started uh, working at different companies. I spent about two years there, and that was really how I got into programming. Working on these real teams kind of uh -huh. just showed me all of the different things that I needed to know and understand that I didn't know. And I had um, really good experience doing that. It was kind of just really eye opening, and the pace that they were working at kind of set my pace for my career uh, from then out then, from then on because out there it's a little different than Mississippi everything's kind of laid back over here over there they're just uh, very very um, I guess dedicated to their to their careers so they were doing things like going to conferences and meetups and and um, writing open source and all the stuff I had really no idea about at the time so um, from then it kind of helped me you know launch my career I guess you'd say that, that's really interesting. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've talked to so many people who basically, you know, whether or not they had some exposure as, as teenagers, you know, like you did, um, 
you know, they got into programming as a profession in their late twenties and they feel like they're way, way, way behind. And, oh my gosh, you know, I'll never learn this stuff. Or, you know, I, I feel like if I had gotten in five years earlier, you know, I would have been way better off. And at the same time, it's okay. Well, you know, Natter here is succeeding and he's succeeding even though he got in, you know, late twenties. And even though, you know, not everything, you know, completely lined up, you know, you were just doing what you were doing and then got, you know, got a job offer out in California and that kind of changed the the face of things. But then you moved back to Mississippi, which isn't exactly a tech hub. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe there are tech hubs in, in Mississippi that I just don't know about, but uh, there aren't. <laughs> there aren't. <laughs> So, so I'd like to talk a little bit about that. I mean, I have people asking that too, right? I live out in the middle of nowhere. There really isn't a tech scene here. I don't know anybody, um, you know, and I don't think anyone's going to hire me to work out here in the middle of Mississippi. So, yeah, so, so how do you get over that? How do you get that's a that? That's super common question. It's, it's kind of a concern I had myself, you know, but, you know, moving back to Mississippi, I kind of did that after about two years, but after about two years, I kind of felt confident enough that, um, I knew that I could probably get jobs in the future. I wasn't really too worried about that. What I was worried about, though, was what you just mentioned, you know, finding a job in Mississippi. So I kept the contract that I had in L.A. Um, that was kind of enough to pay the bills. You know, uh -huh. it's like a remote contract. Um, but what I've learned at this point, it's especially, you know, over the last few years, I mean, remote work is just super, super popular right now. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, I guess the whole idea of... Um, you know, living at a certain place and, and, and having to be there to get jobs, you know, I guess there's, there's something to that, but at the same time, if you kind of, um, do the right things and position yourself in the right way, you'll have just a lot of opportunity, a lot of remote positions that are available. And, you know, if you live maybe in like, I mean, I live in a, uh, what you might consider a small town, it's the capital of Mississippi. Um, and I was able to land a couple of uh, jobs here over the last few years, but, in the last, I guess, two years or so, year and a half, um, none of my clients are from Mississippi. A hundred percent of my work is remote. And um, I think maybe talking about, you know, what people can do to get that type of work, you know, and, and how they should position themselves, I guess, as a developer and, um, and, and, and those sorts of things. And also, I guess, combine that with the other question you asked, like, how do you do that, you know, coming in at a late age? I think really the answer to all of that together is spending a couple of years, you know, getting a general idea of what is available in the, in the tech space. And then once you kind of get a general idea of picking a, a one thing and spending a year or two specializing in that thing and not trying to worry yourself with becoming good at everything, just worrying about, you know, what that one thing is, whether it's um, node development as a, as a uh -huh. backend developer or being the best Postgres developer in the you know in in the region or whatever it, it, whatever it is, specializing and 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 uh, doing that one thing for a couple of years, and then during in the meantime, um, while you're doing that thing, writing blog posts, putting all of your code on uh, up on GitHub and open source, um, if you can, you know, if you if if that's something that um, you have the opportunity to do, if you're not like too busy with a, a full time job or something like that. Um, so, you know, writing blog posts, uh, putting your uh, source code on, on GitHub, and I guess uh, being active in social media to an extent, if you can get on Twitter, uh -huh. and just follow people and, and, and just be visible by doing things like um, responding to a tweet or, or maybe if someone says something that you're interested in, be like, hey, you know, um, I agree with that, or maybe even linking to some blog post that you wrote about it. Just right. all of those things put together. Um, just gets your name out there a little bit. And um, I think the, really the key to um, really being having opportunity as a remote developer, it seems to be specialization, at least yep. from what I've seen. Yeah. Um, so I used to be the host or co-host of the Freelancer Show, which is also a devchat.tv show. And um, it was funny because initially it was, you know, we were talking about, hey, you know, we we build this way and we work this way. And after a year or two, our tune completely changed and we started talking about, you know, billing ahead of time and things like that, you know, so you get prepaid for your time and things like that. But um, one of the other big thrusts that changed was specialization. 
And that that was something that we kind of talked about on and off um, because we did have people who had specialized in particular areas that were succeeding there. Um, The one that comes to mind most obviously is Eric Davis, who was on the show from the beginning. Um, He he was probably one of the most prolific uh, contributors to uh, Redmine, which is a project management open source system written in Ruby on Rails. And uh, I mean, he had he had more work than he could do. He kept sending us work for Redmine because he just had so much of it. And, you know, the, the specialization, you know, whether it's in that kind of a thing where it's this specific app or this specific open source project or whether it's a specific technology like React Native or whether it's a specific, you know, type of concern like uh, HIPAA compliance or PCI compliance. Um, there are companies that need that and they they need that and they don't really need another generalist programmer. And so that, yeah, that's what opens the doors for you is, hey, we can't find anybody else or we can't find very many other people who have specialized in this particular thing that we really, really need expertise in. And it makes it a whole lot easier to get hired. Yes, totally, totally. And it was kind of, um, I've read a couple of books that go over this. Um, I'll, I'll try to, to, to link to them uh, uh-huh. for you if you have any show notes or something like that. But like, when I first started hearing this idea, it was kind of scary for me because I'm like, what if I have a job opportunity that comes up that someone wants me to do this, but they look at my online presence and I'm not talking about that at all, but I do know how to do it. Like, it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're thinking of all these opportunities that you might miss out on when you think about specializing. But in reality, what's the draw for them to hire you for that position anyway? If there's a million people that are just general web developers, like, how are you going to stand out living, yeah. you know, remotely? And if you want that remote position, they're not going to probably hire you. They'll probably hire one of the thousands of people that are in their general area because the general uh, job that they're looking for is just a general job anyway. Mm-hmm. But if there's only a dozen um, specialists in a certain field, um, their chances of them finding one locally where they are, even if they're in San Francisco or something like that, and, and have that person having availability are very slim. So what what what's going to end up happening is you'll get a lot of you'll get a lot more opportunities honestly, and then those opportunities will be better opportunities. You'll be yeah. able to charge more. Um, you'll be able to work on your own terms, and you'll be able to work pick your clients better. You'll be able to kind of only work with the best clients. It just works out that way. I've seen it happen, you know, a lot of times, and it seems to be one of those things you just have to kind of just take the leap and, and trust that it's going to work out. Yep. Just to pile on there, a lot of people say that they want a full-time job but not to consult. You'll make more money consulting, but if you really just want that full-time job, there are companies that will, you know, they're usually larger companies, um, but they'll be able to hire you full-time to do whatever it is that your expertise is into. The the, the next thing that I kind of want to dig into is JavaScript. So, you know, you got, you got into web development. Um, I don't know if you were doing, you know, a specific kind of back-end or front-end or what, but what was it that made you decide, you know what, I want to do this JavaScript thing full time? Yeah, so um, I guess just really not knowing a whole lot about um, tech at the time that I was getting into all this, the first language I really kind of learned was PHP. Right. Um, but looking at the ecosystem as a whole and kind of seeing at the time the current job opportunities and where the, a lot of the momentum was. And at the time it was, I think Node was just coming uh, into popularity. Angular was kind of just coming out. Um, and I guess by chance, the first gig that I kind of landed in, in LA was with a um, company that was building a, an application that was using PhoneGap, and everything in in the company was was JavaScript. So I was uh-huh. kind of around all of these JavaScript fanatics, and and really working with them. Um, you know, I learned JavaScript. I wouldn't say I learned it pretty well, but I, I learned it for the first time there, and. Um, and then I really kind of took a step back actually after that, after that job and kind of was like thinking, looking at how much I still had to learn with JavaScript. I was, I knew I was still a beginner. I knew that there was just so much to learn. And I was like, if I'm going to dedicate, you know, the next year to um, learning something, I want to make sure that what I'm learning is going to be, you know, viable uh, option for my career. And I looked at a few things. Uh, I think Python, um, I didn't really know too much about what was going on. I was looking at Java and PHP. But just seeing that um, the momentum of JavaScript, uh, looking at Angular, and it was a really cool 
fun thing to work with. It was still brand new. Um, and looking at the fact that all of the browsers only really run JavaScript and it just seemed like it was going to be um, a viable thing for me to get into. And I kind of already had a little bit of experience with it. I kind of uh, decided to just start only looking at JavaScript and spending all my free time learning JavaScript and becoming as good at it as I could. Um, so that was kind of a, an intentional step at that point um, uh-huh. that I kind of made the decision to you know focus on JavaScript, just kind of learn at the time I was learning jQuery um, and stuff like that as well. That's really cool. And um, I think I think the first time we got together in person was at a NGConf. Yeah, I think I, I think I saw you at NGConf, but I think the first time we met oh, it might have um, been like you was a React rally, I think. Oh, that could have been. Um, but I, I was I've been to pretty much I went to the first two or three NGComps because I was totally into yeah. Angular, you know, at the time. Yep. Um I think you might be right. Um I have never attended React Rally. But it's in Salt Lake City, so I, I've, I've driven up like every year that they've done it and had lunch with somebody I know who's attending. Yeah, so. right. I think we had dinner one night. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, anyway, and that's when you pitched uh, React Native Radio to me. Um, I'm curious, and this isn't one of the questions that I typically ask, but you know, y- you have specialized toward React Native, and so you know, we dig in programming. We get a little more specific JavaScript. What was it about React Native? What what made you go over there and go, hey? This this is this is the stuff. This is where I want to live. Well, so before I got into React Native, I was really into so I got into jQuery Mobile was the first uh-huh. mobile thing I kind of really got into. And at the same time, I was still like using Angular a lot in my day to day work. And then um, so I was I was like I was I was always fascinated by mobile development in general. But because I was a JavaScript developer, um, even looking into a native iOS development or native Android development was just very overwhelming for me. So I was never, I never dedicated the time to learn it. Um, right. It wasn't really something that was uh, viable at the time for me anyway, as, a, as kind of a beginner. Um, someone that was still trying to, I guess, just cement my, um, you know, myself in the industry. So like anything I could do with JavaScript that would open more doors for me was awesome. So the jQuery mobile kind of did that. I was able to kind of build what you might call a mobile application, but it was more like, you know, uh, a Colic and mobile website. And then with Angular, Ionic came out. So I jumped in the Ionic train. I really loved Ionic and I still do like Ionic a lot. Um, Ionic was, uh, I was still kind of an intermediate developer at that point. I feel uh, maybe beginner even. And, um, but I was able to build really, really interesting um, mobile applications using Ionic and, um, and still, still be able to, to use my existing skill set. So it kind of, um, did that for a while. Did, I built a few apps using Ionic. Um, and then I saw that React Native came out. And um, that the fact that React Native actually takes what Cordova was doing and takes it kind of a step further uh-huh. and allows you to, to build, you know, what are almost indistinguishable from, from native apps. But using JavaScript is super, super appealing to me because it was kind of what everybody wanted at the time, but nobody actually was able to achieve. Uh-huh. The first, you know, the first really, um, I guess, feasible option or feasible uh, solution was was React Native. So when that came out, I, I, I automatically just was drawn to it. And I, and I saw a huge opportunity because I was like, you know, if this thing actually takes off, it's going to be pretty huge. It's just it, at the time and, and even now, you know, the, the price of mobile developers is just, is just crazy. So anything that can... Um, bring more developers to the ecosystem and can kind of lower the price of uh, building applications um, and can do so in, um, in a way that you're delivering a good experience. It just seemed like, you know, a good thing. So, um, so I pretty much knew right away that, that this was going to be pretty big. So I kind of dedicated the next year to specializing in React Native, really. Um, what I did at that point was read as many, you know, uh, I think there was only one book. It was Bonnie Eisenman, uh, Eisenman. Um, her O'Reilly book. Um, I took as many tutorials as I could. I read the source code, stayed up to date with uh, the release notes, and uh, just stayed on Stack Overflow, answering as many questions as I possibly could. And doing that, you kind of learn, learn, you know, things I guess that you normally wouldn't have right. run into. So you're like, oh, how would I, uh, you know, how would I solve this problem? And then I, you know, open a new project with React Native, solve the problem, put the answer on Stack Overflow. 
And I did that for about a year. And then um, I think after that, I really started seeing some doors open up because I became one of the the top people on React, uh, on, on React Native on Stack Overflow. And um, that seemed to have started giving me opportunities like book uh, book offers and things like that. Yeah, and you're also, working on a book with Manning, aren't you? Yeah, we're uh, we're done with the book. It's uh, called React Native in Action. You can download all 12, 12 chapters. Um, we're actually not in paper form yet because we're updating the first chapter and a couple other chapters because of some API changes. Uh-huh. And you know, the API turn with React Native is is uh, is kind of something that I'm worried about with this book because. I'm wondering if we publish it, like how long will that paperback stay, you know, good enough? It's almost the type of book where I think it would be better to stay in digital form. But yeah, you can buy it now. Um, it's it pretty much covers everything A to Z for pretty much in, up to beginner to inter- intermediate stuff with React Native. Nice. I I could also see maybe just putting in the front of the book, um, you know, just React Native changes fairly often. Here's how you get this specific version of React Native. You know, all the examples are in this version. If you want yeah, to get yeah, the yeah. digital so copy, it's up to date. Yeah, version. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can do that. You can just start with a certain version. Yep. But anyway, that that's really cool. And I've been getting updates because uh, Manning reached out to me and said, "Hey, do you want the early access version of this?" And I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> but I, I haven't had time to dig into React Native the way that I want. So uh, always something. There's always something on fire over here. I'm telling you. <laughs> But, yes, but that's always. awesome. So, so yes, you got into React Native. Um, and then, yeah, you've kind of added all these things to the ecosystem for, for other React Native developers. You know, you have the podcast, you're doing the trainings, you're writing the book. Um, is there anything you want to add on those things before you talk about anything else that you've got going on? Yes. Yeah, so um, we have, you know, the things that you mentioned. And then we have our uh, React Native training open source uh, repository or open source um, I guess organization, and we have uh, we do have like one pretty popular um, repo. It's called React Native Elements. It's basically like a UI toolkit for React Native, and um, it's comparable, I guess, to something like Twitter Bootstrap. And um, I have a couple of really really great co contributors that kind of maintain the project at this point. But it's it's one of the most popular projects in in the React Native ecosystem. And then we have a few other projects in there too, like um, just random things, I guess you would say that you might need. Um, also, we have examples of how to build React Native apps with uh, things like Redux or different data architectures. Um, examples of how to use push notifications. Just you know, random examples of things that you'll probably need to know if you're kind of just getting into React Native. Right. Very cool. I don't know if there's anything else that I'm really looking to dig into. I'm curious though. Do you feel like there are, it's funny, when I talk to people about their careers, they, a lot of people feel like there are like overarching themes or ideas or lessons that they can pull out of their experience and share with people. And I'm just curious, I mean, do you feel like there's been kind of a theme or, you know, something that's just kind of, you know, followed you through your career that's a, a principle or an idea that, that people can act on in their own careers? Yeah, I think the one thing that's given me the most, I guess, return on investment, if you call it that, is just sharing things in general, any type of content, um, whether it be blogging, whether it be um, open source, whether it be just uh, jumping into a conversation on Twitter. And and I kind of consider that content because you're kind of talking, just doing as much writing in in general as possible just seems to be um, the, the best you know, uh, thing that I've done ever since I started uh-huh. blogging, ever since I started um, kind of uh, creating YouTube videos and, and things like that, I just seem to have uh, had a lot more doors open. And I don't know um, if it is organic or if it's kind of uh, an exact, I mean, I'm not sure if I can kind of like connect the um, opportunities that I've had directly with those, but it just seems the more that uh, I share, the more opportunities that kind of come my way. And I think I've seen that a lot in, in other people as well. And it's going to, it's kind of been one of the um, the few things that I've tried to really stay consistent with. Um, so if every month goes by, I have a written a blog post. I try to write one. Um, try to you know try to keep up with my YouTube videos. Whenever I have a new idea, I either create a video right away or I put it on my spreadsheet to do later. Um, and, and and it's and it, and it was very hard to do at first because, um, I, I, for example, I wrote a blog post one time and I and I and I said something that was incorrect. 
And you always have that fear of, uh, in, uh-huh. your, in your mind of like saying the wrong thing and then having someone come back and, um, and, and correct you. But if you can, if you can deal with that type of stuff and, and realize that, um, it's not the end of the world if you put some code on GitHub and it's like the completely, um, incorrect way to do something, that's how you're going to learn because someone's going to maybe come behind you and show you the right way. And then you can simply just update your code or, or, or whatever, you know, it's, it's just, uh, I guess getting over for me that fear of, being, um, you know, I guess picked apart, uh, your, your ideas picked apart. Yeah. And, um, and once I got over that, then I, then I think it was uh, wide open from there. Yeah. That makes sense. Cool. Well, the last thing that we do on this show is picks. This episode is sponsored by Linode. Linode is offering listeners of this podcast a $20 credit, which is good for four free months at their lowest plan. Their plans start at one gigabyte of RAM for $5 a month. You can get your servers in any of their 10 data centers, and their high memory plans start at 16 gigabytes. Get a server running in under a minute. They do hourly billing with a monthly cap on all plans and add-on services like backups, node balancers, long view, etc. VMs for full control, running Docker containers, encrypted disks, VPNs, etc. You can run a private Git server. They provide native SSD storage, 200 gigabit network, and Intel E5 processors. They have 24-7 friendly support, even on holidays, and a seven-day money-back guaranteed. So go check them out at linode.com slash JavaScript Jabber. And you're familiar with picks. You do them on React Native Radio. So uh, do you have some picks you want to share? Sure. So mine is a book and I've read this book or I haven't read this book. Actually, I've listened to this book on Audible, which is could be it's a pick up within and of itself, which is basically how I consume most of my um, non-technical books lately, which is basically listen to audio books, which uh-huh. is uh, the company is Audible. But the book is uh, A Guide to the Good Life, An Ancient Art of Stoic Joy. And it's written by William B. Irvine. And it's kind of uh, it's probably like one of my top 10 favorite books. And I'm just now reading it again. So it's kind of uh, on the top of my head. It's a really, really great book. And if you never looked into Stoicism or if you're interested by philosophy at all, I think it's one of the better books out there because it kind of takes all of these really ancient ideas and kind of modernizes them. And the author really is able to convey you know, the ideas really well. And um, it's really helped me um, mentally kind of just it, w- with every aspect of my life, I guess you'd say. So I would totally check that out if you're interested in stuff like that. Nice. I'm going to jump in here with a couple of picks as well. I'm going to pick a book on Audible. Um, It's the book I've been listening to lately. And uh, just to explain why I'm listening to it, because I've listened to it in the past, really enjoyed it. Um, But the author, Brandon Sanderson, came out with another book in the series. It came out on the 14th, which was a week or so ago. Um, And I was like, oh, I've got to get that. And so I... I downloaded it and started listening to it, and I was like, I don't remember all the details from the series, so I had to go back. So the first book in the series is The Way of Kings, um, and the series is called The Stormlight Archives. Uh, The second book is Words of Radiance, and the third one is Oathbringer. And so um, anyway, I've, I've really enjoyed his stuff. I think I have downloaded everything or nearly everything that he has put out that they have on Audible. So, um, you know, Brandon Sanderson's stuff is, is terrific. He actually lives here in Utah somewhere, but, and, uh, and that, and that's not why I'm a fan of his, his, his books are just incredible. So, um, I've been enjoying those. And then, um, one other thing that I'm just going to put out there is, um, you know, Natter talked about learning to solve problems and working in a space and, and, and specializing. And I'm also just going to talk briefly about just scratching your own itch because um, a lot of people, they get in and, and I'm teaching a course on how to find a job. And a lot of people ask me, what, what should I do for a side project? Right. You know, if you don't have a full time job, you're trying to get some experience. What should I work on? And they're like, should I build a Twitter clone or, you know, some of these other uh, project ideas that are sort of out there on the Internet and popular? And I'm always telling them, no, don't do that. Um, Instead, pick a project that you really care about, right? I mean, it could be the the world's 90 millionth budgeting app. But if that's what you really care about, build that. If it's a music app, build that. If it's, you know, whatever it is. And it doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be perfect. But the things that you're going to learn and the motivation you're going to get from working on it because you care about it is going to trump any... 
um, help you're going to get by building a Twitter clone the same way somebody else built a Twitter clone. And so, you know, I've, I've been doing this for podcasting. Um, I have a system now that uh, manages uh, the sponsorships for the podcasts. And um, I hadn't really done a ton of code for a while. And when I picked that up, it was just very, very gratifying and a lot of fun to work on something that I cared about that wasn't sort of the traditional, oh, I'm doing yet another exercise. So uh, I'm going to pick that as well. It's more of an idea, I guess, than something you go buy at the store. And then I'm also going to encourage folks, if you want to learn React Native, um, go check out uh, Natter and Mike's uh, company and uh, go pick up uh, React Native in action. Uh, Natter, if people want to hire you guys or if they want to read your blog or find you on Twitter or GitHub, wh wh where do they go? Yeah, so they can go to reactnative.training um, or they can go to github.com slash react-native-training. And also about our blog, um, we do have a really good blog, and you were mentioning um, a few resources earlier that I didn't really go into our blog. But our blog has uh, not only content by me and my partner, but we also have contributors from all over the React Native ecosystem. So any um, authors that are already writing stuff about React Native, they'll, they'll kind of uh, contribute articles to our blog. So we have a pretty good range of stories there. And if you're listening and you're uh, into React Native, um, we're also looking for uh, additional authors. So if you kind of have an original idea that you've uh, wanted to kind of blog about in the React Native space, uh, feel free to reach out and we can add you as a contributor. Awesome. That's on Medium, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, Medium. So um, it's like medium.com slash React Native training. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for coming, Natter. It was uh, a pleasure to get to know you over the last few years and to see you last week in New York City. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. This is really cool to be on the show. I, I've, I've listened to a few episodes. So, um, it's really cool to actually come on. So, <laughs> Cool. Yeah, well, it's it's fun to just chat and see where people come from and what they're doing. And um, also just to kind of highlight, you know what? You don't have to come into this field as a seven-year-old, right? You can come in as a 20-something-year-old or a 30 something year old. And you know what, people are successful from there too. And, you know, if there's one thing that I've learned from this show, yeah, some people they get exposed early, and they just kind of always have done computers. But there are a lot of people out there who have contributed to huge, huge libraries have created just massive contributions to the JavaScript community that got into this as a second career in their 30s. So you know, no matter what your background is, um, you know, you're, you're welcome here and we want to see you contribute. So uh, I'll get off my soapbox now and end the show. But <laughs> thank you for coming again, Natter. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye, everybody. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.